and so on. So not everybody agrees uh, that there is XMRV in prostate cancer, and there's a bunch of papers that have come out saying that they don't find the virus in prostate cancers. And many of them use tests that they've developed. Uh, there are no good um, control uh, samples that are known positives or known negatives. So it's really hard to say if these people would have picked up prostate uh, XMRV from any cases or not. You know, it's, it's, hard, it's just hard to assess. So this may be real. This may be real that in, in Europe there's no XMRV in prostate cancer patients uh, or not. And, and the jury is still out. And um, so, so there's a lot of variation. And so here's a paper from um, Emory University that does find um, uh, XMRV in prostate cancer. And the numbers, are, their number, they, they came up with is exactly 27%. And Jason Kimata finds XMRV um, in 25% uh, of prostate cancers. And um, Ike finds it also in about 20% of prostate cancers. So, so those who find it are roughly finding this 20, 25%. And, and those who find, do not find it you know, are, are coming up with zero. So um, we'll see what happens with that. Last year in October, um, uh, there was a paper that I was very surprised to see that there was uh, XMRV in chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay? And they identified XMRV DNA in 67% of patients and on only 3.7% of healthy controls. Okay? So, um, and again, this is controversial. So there are a few other studies which failed to detect XMRV. Um, and there's, you know, from, from mostly from Europe. And there was a, mo a more recent study uh, from the NIH and FDA which found um, XMRV-related viruses. So, um, fortunately, I don't have a slide here. Yeah? Maybe this is a silly question, but is it possible that this virus is contained geographically, and that's why nobody in Europe can find it, but everybody in America can? No, I, I think there's too much traffic between the U.S. and Europe to have no virus in one place and a lot of virus in another. I think what is more likely is that there are sequence variations in different geographical locations. And people who are not finding the virus are using primarily just PCR to look for the virus. And PCR is so sequence specific so it's quite likely that your primers will pick up things in the U.S. and will not pick up, you know, even if there is related virus in Europe, will not pick that up. Having said that, though, um, from the meeting that Suzanne and I just came back, Judy Mikovits just showed that she is able to detect some 40% or something positives for XMRV in patients from um, around London. Um, and the poly, and the polytropic viruses. So I think a lot needs to be done in defining our tests better. Okay. So we are um, involved in our own chronic fatigue syndrome study. And I just want to sort of emphasize in what ways it is different from the other studies. So it's a relatively large study compared to everything else that's been published. It has 200 healthy volunteers and 105 chronic fatigue syndrome patients. What is important is that both the patients and the controls are from the same geographic area, meaning in and around Salt Lake City. Um, remember in the Mikovits study, the original science paper, um, the patients are from three or four different geography, geographical locations in the country. They're from New York State, they're from the Nevada Incline Valley area, they're from Florida, um, North Carolina, and then all the controls are from Maryland. Okay? And the most recent Lowe and Harvey Alter paper has the same thing. Okay. Um, where the patients are all from the Boston area and the controls are all again from Maryland. 
So if we're talking about sequence differences like we just discussed, you could easily find that one population is 80% and the other population is 4%. Okay? So I think it's very important to do that. So, so we are doing that. Uh, it's also important, so here's another thing that not all the studies have because they, these are samples that were collected at different times. Um, they are not even in the same anticoagulant. They were not processed in the same way. Um, so, so ours are different. And all of our samples are freshly collected, not stored in some freezer. And then I think, very important, we're not just relying on PCR to do our analysis. We're actually growing the virus in cells in exactly the same method that Judy Mikovits used. And we're applying a bunch of different tests to detect RNA, to detect DNA, to detect viral proteins, and then to look for viral culture. So these are our, um, the only reason I think our, our study can be so awesome is that we have um, Alan and Kathy Light, uh, who are also going to participate by doing the exercise analysis. And then we have the most awesome Cindy Bateman, uh, who, who's recruiting the patients in this study. And then uh, the help from AREP laboratories in not just in collecting the patients and bloods, but also in helping us develop the tests. So, uh, and these are the people from my lab who are uh, involved in the test development and in testing, Clifford Shin, Robert Schlauberg, and Ashley Bunker. So my time is up. So um, the other thing that we're doing is we are also um, getting samples from Judy Mikovits um, uh, in order to get known positive and known negative controls. And the way this is done is that the phlebotomy staff sends samples directly from the patients to our lab, so there's no suspicion of contamination that may have occurred in a place that has XMRV, and that these are blinded and we're going to analyze these. Um, finally, I just want to take a minute to tell you about our study, which uh, tested 45 different antivirals to see which ones act on XMRV. This is the list of drugs that were tested, and um, we found only four to be effective. And uh, one is AZT or uh, ZDV. This one is TDF, um, raltegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, and this is a, um, uh, an integrase inhibitor that's not being marketed for human use at the moment. You can get it for animals from Merck. And, um, these, none of the protease inhibitors work, by the way, none, not one. And uh, the other thing we showed is that these drugs are synergistic when used in combination. So here's raltegravir and TDF, which act in synergy, and raltegravir and AZT also act in synergy. And we've tested pairwise comparison of many of them, and they're all either synergistic or at least additive. And raltegravir is probably the most potent. It works at five nanomolar concentration. So um, finally, since I know I'll be asked about this, I might as well preempt this, um, is, is that, uh, yes, uh, there is a possibility of a clinical trial um, using uh, some of these drugs, but really it's too early. So one of the things we need to do before we can have a clinical trial is a show that the virus is there in chronic fatigue syndrome. Our own study, we haven't um, had enough time to analyze it to know that and then to see that if we can detect um, uh, virus in order to, to treat these people. Um, so whenever there is a study, it will be a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-drug study um, using about 20, 25 <laughs> patients in each arm of the study. So there'll be a three-arm study or something. Um, and uh, there is a fair amount of interest both from Merck and from uh, Gilead in, uh, in, in carrying out such a study, but um, there's a lot that needs to be done before we can do this well. Okay? And, but we are talking to everyone concerned and, and uh, moving as fast as we can towards seeing if there is a place for doing something like this or not. These are the people in my lab, and I um, told you already who was doing what, and my collaborators from uh, uh, I already told you about Alan, Kathy, and Cindy, and I didn't get a chance to talk about the other work, so I can take questions.